and welcome to the last talk of the Target Jobs Law National Pupilage Fair. I think most of you have probably been in at least once today already. Um, my name's Matt, I'm the bar editor of Target Jobs Law and for the Pupilage's Handbook. Um, this is the Family Law Talk, um, and I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves this time as they feel comfortable. Hello, I'm Michael Edwards, I'm at Four Paper Buildings. I did pupilage in 2010, so I've been at the bar about four or five years. Um, I primarily do uh, child abduction cases, but I also uh, keep my hand in other areas of law, like care proceedings and uh, financial remedies proceedings, what we call money cases. So I cover kind of a broad range of family law. That's me. Hello, I'm Frances Harris. I'm at One King's Bench Walk. I'm one of the most junior tenants in my chambers. I became a tenant in October, so I did pupillage at One King's Bench Walk last year, and I was called to the bar the year before that, so in 2013. I do a broad range of family law work, everything from care proceedings to the more international work that Michael describes to uh, financial remedy cases and cases involving domestic violence. I think that's, that's probably all I have to say at this point. Over to Emma. Hi, uh, I'm Emma Greenhalsh. I am a family barrister at 9 St John Street Chambers in Manchester. I also did my pupillage in 2010, so I'm about four and a half years cool now. I uh, practice all areas of family law, but mostly practice uh, public law work and act for a 50-50 mix of local authorities and children. Um, I also do a little bit of ancillary relief and some private law children work as well. But being based in Manchester, don't do much uh, international work or child abduction work. So um, you've all shown great stamina to get to this point in the day. <laughs> uh, in many ways, this is the graveyard slot, but you're all still here, so that's great. Uh, what we want to do is to get quite quickly to questions and answers, because um, this is the time and you know one of the main times in the year for a lot of you to ask the questions that you want to do that you want to ask just before you make your uh, pupillage applications, or even if you're not making the application this year when you come to um, apply, and if you're going to apply to family chambers, um, any questions that you have, this is the time to ask them. Um, we've got a few uh, bullet points, headlines, that we're going to run through first before we do that. Um, the first of those is an uh, obvious question, really, but why we uh, decided to come to the bar, why we decided to come to the family bar. Uh, from my point of view, it was an accident, really. Um, I wanted to do something which had a lot of advocacy, so you're in court a lot. Um, so then what does that leave you with? Crime, family, possibly immigration, housing. Um, so I did a few mini pupillages, which some of you may have done or are about to do, and found family the most interesting uh, because it covers, as we've already mentioned, such a broad range of different kinds of cases. Um, and you're really uh, involved in people's lives at a kind of emergency stage so they'll come to a family lawyer where something's gone wrong in their lives, frankly, um, and they're looking for an answer, and that's why they come to a barrister. Um, that obviously leads into a lot of other um, issues. Like, as a family lawyer, you're not really just a lawyer. You're also a social worker, a psychologist, psychiatrist. Uh, you hold yourself out as various different things, um, and you have to try and you know, master all of these things pretty quickly, so it's quite demanding. Um, but all of that is, you know, all part of the interest of the job and you have to uh, get on top of all of those things really quickly. So, you know, from my point of view, uh, as I say, I came into it sort of by accident, ended up doing family, but haven't been disappointed. It's a very interesting area of law uh, in court about five days a week, uh, which is great, out and about. Um, so I would definitely recommend it as an area to, of law to anyone who's thinking about this and other areas. Perhaps if I take what find what what I've talk talk to you a little bit about what I find appealing about being a family lawyer. As I say, I'm one of the most junior tenants in my chambers, so I've been on my feet for almost a year and properly a, in, a member of chambers since October. And what I really like about my job is that it's so different. I could be in court one day in I don't know Canterbury worrying about whether the person I'm acting for has injured their child, as the local authority suggests. And the next day I might be in Birmingham wondering about whether the husband in another case has completely told his wife about everything he owns when they're getting divorced. And on Thursday I might be in Hastings 
doing something completely different, perhaps involving domestic violence and uh, and allegations that one party is making about another. And it's not just the differing types of work that I'm doing that I think makes it interesting, because obviously every case is slightly different, so it always keeps you on your toes. And I think you can't... I'm not sure that I could ask a lot more from a job other than that I was constantly interested and challenged by it, and that's something that I've certainly found to be true at the family bar. Like Michael says, I think on average people in my chambers go to court something like three to five days a week. So if you're after advocacy experience, which I certainly was, it's definitely the right place to come. I I can't recommend it highly enough, frankly. It's it's a great job. It's it's a it, it is genuinely fascinating to find out about other people's lives. And I would heartily recommend it to you if you're considering it over other areas. I will take the um, second sort of bullet point area, which is what types of cases do we deal with? I know that you all know that we're family lawyers, um, but family is generally sort of split into two areas. Um, first area is, is child work, and the second area, it can be money work, um, so divorce, ancillary relief. <coughs> Within the um, children aspect of, of family law, there are sort of various limbs to that. So you can have uh, public law work, uh, which is where the state intervention, local authorities are involved in families' lives. Um, children sometimes are removed from the care of their parents because of the, the state intervention. Um, there are also cases where two parents are disputing over an issue. It can either be where a child will live or how long or how much uh, time a child will spend with an absent parent or it can be something really discreet like what school a child shall go to or what name they'll be known by and with uh, the final area that sort of comes under the children aspect is the area that Michael's spoken to a little bit about already which is sort of the international work and within that there are also other sort of subheadings you can have forced marriage work you can have cases where children are taken overseas which is typically abduction type work and so it's a really really varied area uh, which kind of feeds into why I chose to come to the family bar because it is so diverse and as Francis has said every day can can provide a different challenge uh, and every day you can be doing something totally different if you want to do all of the areas that come under the family umbrella. Um, Can I just ask for a show of hands if anyone has done a family mini pupillage? So that's about uh, a fifth, if I got that wrong, yeah, less than a something fifth. something like that, yeah. Um, I would highly recommend that to anyone who is thinking about a family law pupillage, even thinking about an application, uh, because that's the way you really get an understanding of what goes on in a family chambers um, and, frankly, in a family courtroom, because uh, it's not like the criminal courts. You can't just go and sit in the public gallery and watch barristers um, advocating. Family courts are in private. So you have to go through the professional route, through chambers or solicitors' firms. Um, But it's essential, really, to working out what family lawyers do on a daily basis because it's a very different job to being a criminal barrister, for example. Um, And on a mini-pupilage, you will see uh, maybe a conference before the hearing, the hearing itself, uh, and then um, anything that happens after the hearing, and then you're back to chambers and you get a feeling for what the atmosphere in the chambers is. Um, the other important point is that every chambers is different. Um, there's quite a few chambers in London, maybe 10 to 15 specialist family chambers, all with quite a different character. Um, I'm sure similar thing in Manchester. Um, chambers that do family and other areas of law, but still very strong family teams. And I'm, I'm sure Emma would say different characteristics of each chambers. It's important to get a feel for that before you make your application. Um, yeah, Emma, do you want to... I was going to ask, is anybody interested in applying to chambers outside of London? I don't know whether you to sort of give me a show of hands. Yeah, there are a few people. As I thought it might be useful for me just to give you a little bit of insight to what it's like to practice in one of the provincial areas. Um, because I know there's sort of a heavy presence today from London sets and obviously at today's conference and today's talks taking place at Lincoln's Inn. But I'm at um, 9 St John Street, which is a pra- uh, chambers in Manchester. And my chambers has a real mixed practice. So I'm in a family team of about 15, uh, but we also have crime, employment, personal injury and chancery teams within chambers, um, which is unlike some of the uh, London sets where there is a specialism for that particular set. And uh, I know that both Francis and Michael practice in exclusively family sets. Um, 
I don't think that I travel quite as much as London-based council. That can be something that may or may not attract you. Um, I, I, it's not that I don't travel beyond Manchester, sometimes I do, but probably only go out of Manchester City Centre one day in every third week. Um, I'm in court most weeks, five days, um, and I do a variety of work. I think what is missing at the Manchester Family Bar is the lack of international work. There isn't, it's not fair to say there is no international child abduction work or forced marriage work. Um, but there is certainly um, less of it because the majority of it takes place uh, down here. Uh, that's not to say you wouldn't get any exposure, but I think if you were going to apply to one of the provincial cities, you should be aware of that. Um, and it just depends really what sort of um, areas within the family sphere you're particularly interested in. Um, but you can, of course, still... I know people on the Northern Circuit that still commute to London to do that particular uh, type of work. And being outside of London has uh, quite a lot of advantages as well. Uh, it's cheaper to live. Chambers rent is normally uh, reduced from that of the London sets because the, the, the rent on the buildings, for example, is, is usually less. And so that's passed on to members of Chambers. Um, but sometimes I do think it would be nice to practice down here and be able to be sort of on the doorstep of the RCJ and tip up and do that sometimes more exciting uh, buzz work that goes on. So it, it has its disadvantages and advantages and it's something that you need to weigh up and have a think about and maybe do many pupillages outside of London if you do have an interest in practicing outside of London so you can get a feel for it and make your own mind up. Um, our next bullet point, well the bullet point that we've chosen the lifestyle implications of this area's practice. Um, Francis, do you want to say your experience of the first year and a half? Mm. Well, I think anyone who's thinking about applying for pupillage has already got a pretty good idea of what the sort of lifestyle implications would be of a career at the family bar. I think we'd be lying if we said to you that it wasn't going to be hard work. I certainly would say that my pupillage um, I, was, I was kept busy, certainly, during my year of pupillage. But was it the sort of horrific horror story that you, you might have heard about? It certainly wasn't for me. So I wouldn't go into it thinking this is going to be the worst year of my life because actually I had a really fantastic time during pupillage. I learnt a lot, I was busy, and yes, it was pretty stressful, but frankly I was going to court on my own for the first time. So that was, it was unlikely not to be a little bit worrying. But I wouldn't necessarily be terrified about the prospect of what is what, what can seem to some people to be a year-long job interview, because it, I, I, it wasn't my perception that it was like that all the time. Um, just to you know, give a dose of realism, um, or the other side of the coin, I, my experience of pupillage was the same, pretty much. It was a, basically a positive experience, um, you know, not not a uh, a horror story or a year-long job interview at all. But what I do want to say is that uh, you do have to come to the family bar with your eyes open um, because there are serious difficulties. Um, number one, with getting there in the first place. Uh, and number two, what's actually on offer when you do get there. Um, the bar in general, and the family bar particularly, is a career that's you know, full of huge rewards. You know, you're self-employed. Uh, your colleagues will be interesting, um, different, diverse people. Uh, you're out in different courts and you're, you're doing a job you know that's um, has far more responsibility than you probably find almost anywhere else um, on the other hand there's huge risks which partly come with being self-employed you're basically your own boss and you have to um, make your own way it's pretty much a pure meritocratic system you know if a solicitor thinks you're good they'll come back if they don't they probably won't um, so you've got to deal with all of that you've got to deal with the stress of being in uh, Medway County Court at six o'clock, uh, finishing off your case where you know your clients just had their children removed, and the clerk, your phone's buzzing in your pocket, and the clerks are calling you saying you need to be in the High Court for three hearings the next day, and you haven't prepared or haven't even opened the papers, haven't even got back to chambers to open the papers. So these are the kind of the the realities that you have to face. It's not your average job. It's um, pretty fast paced. Uh, you're going to have to cancel a lot of social events with your friends. Uh, if you're in court five days a week, you're pretty much working six days a week mm -hmm. um, because you can't just turn up to court on a Monday and wing it. 
I tried. Uh, <laughs> you come unstuck quite quickly. Um, you know, it's a job that demands a lot of your time. But the rewards and the benefits, if you're in for that, are, are huge. But it, but it is a big commitment and it's uh, certainly not something to go into lightly. Mm. I, I would echo um, the comments about pupillage. Um, my pupillage certainly was not a horror story. I um, was met with a group of people who offered me a great deal of support, friendship, guidance, time, effort. Um, I was set a piece of written work every single weekday night of my first six, which um, I think is quite unusual. That's cruel. Um, <laughs> but it stood me in really good stead for them when I was on my own in my second six. And I, I say on my own, I still had the support of my pupil <coughs> supervisor, but um, every night she would set me a different task. And if we were on a case that was running like a final hearing, she would say to me, right, pretend tonight you're acting for father. I want you to come in tomorrow with your cross-examination of the social worker ready or whatever. And it was really, really good experience. And the feedback was, was really worthwhile and, and obviously very useful. Um, about sort of lifestyle implications now, um, yes, Michael is absolutely right. This is a six-day job. I don't remember the last time I had a Sunday off. Um, but I often take Saturday off completely, which is nice, and give myself that break between Friday and then thinking about work again on the Monday. Um, I don't often do much on weeknights other than work, but I don't work every night until 3am. Sometimes it's just a couple of hours just to refresh in my memory or have a look at what's going on tomorrow. Um, one thing that you need to get used to, and I think this it is a skill that is absolutely vital at the family bar, you have to be able to analyse and interpret facts very quickly and read documents at a fair pace because you often get a brief at four or five o'clock for the next day. And I think Michael referred to sometimes getting three briefs for the next day. And they can be voluminous and you have to just get through it and be ready for 9am. It's an unusual job because normally people start work at 9am for the day and they think about what tasks they want to do when they get to the desk at 5 to 9. We have to be ready to go at 9am. You can't say to the judge when you go in front of them at 10 o'clock, I need to read the papers. You have to have already read them <laughs> before you get there. Uh, but so rewarding in many ways and, and it, it, it is worthwhile. You get in, you get out, sorry, what you put into it. I think we've covered almost the last bullet point as well, which is what the key skills are. Obviously, just echo that, you know, you need to be someone who can pick things up quite quickly. Um, but, you know, probably all of the talks would say that that's basically being a barrister. Mm. You, you're brought mm. in late um, because the solicitor deals with the case throughout and you come in just to do the court part of it. And you've got to get up to speed quite quickly and you have to try and inspire confidence in your client, you know, from the moment you meet them. And that's pretty challenging, especially for uh, people at the younger end of the spectrum, like us. Mm -hmm. uh, often your clients are a lot older than you and you know, they've been through a lot more than we have mm -hmm. um, but you have to remember it's just a job and we're there to provide advice and to be the lawyer and to say this is how it's going to pan out and try to draw a division between you as a practitioner and them who's going through this kind of emergency situation <laughs> in their lives that you're just trying to help them with frankly I think you do sometimes feel a bit like you're a, a social dustbin man, cleaning up mm -hmm. other people's problems all the time. I think rapport is a really key skill to have if, you, if you've if you got it. You, you need to have that with, with clients who sometimes can be very unsavoury characters, sometimes difficult characters, uh, most of the time going through very difficult periods in their life and you have to try and build up that level of rapport with them and, and inspire some confidence uh, swiftly before you go into court or often you might only have 20 minutes with them on the morning of a hearing. Um, so that's a skill that I would say is, is a vital one. I wonder if now is the time to go over to you, as it were. Has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask us? Um, in terms of um, the applications, um, I know they ask for uh, two references, I think. Um, do you prefer um, one from a university um, tutor or one from um, your law school if you've finished you know, your BPTC? Um, our application system is outside of the pupillage portal. So we have our own, it follows the same timetable, but we have our own application form, uh, which is a bit simpler as I think four questions that you have to ask, answer. Um, and I think the referee situation is pretty much the same. You have to have two, one academic and one non-academic. Um, so you're talking about the academic referee? Yeah. 
uh, it, it really depends on your own circumstances. You know, if you're someone who really uh, wants to emphasise your first degree, um, then get a reference from your tutor there. If maybe you've done a lot of experience, you've done a lot of work experience or other things since your degree, and maybe that's four or five years in the background, you might want someone from your bar, bar course. So it really depends. I mean, I I wouldn't say there's a preference. To be honest, I I can't imagine that there will be a preference in our applications either what I would say about referees is you I suppose it goes without saying but you just want to pick the person who you think is going to give you the best reference so if you have a particularly good rapport with a university tutor then I would go for them I, I wouldn't be too unless it was a really long time in your past and you've had a lot you've done a lot of other things since you were at university say um, I wouldn't be too worried about whether it was Bar, the bar tutor that you had last year or some, a tutor that you had at university maybe maybe two years ago. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I don't think there's anything that I can really add to that. I think both of them have given really sensible answers. That's fine, mm -hmm. thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, could I just ask a little bit about um, sort of how broad your practices are and how much scope there is for that if, for example, you were interested um, in kind of the sort of legally, legal aid side of things, but obviously wanted to perhaps subsidise that with, with doing work in more of a kind of private sphere. Is there scope for that? Because the impression I very much get is that there's a real push to kind of specialise and that's sort of the way forward. Um, so I just wondered what your views were on that. Well, I mean, first thing is that it depends which chambers you go to. Probably before that, whether you're going to be in London or outside London. I, mean, I think Emma's touched on it. You'll probably get a more diverse pupillage outside of London because it probably wouldn't even just be a family pupillage. Yeah, at my set, we, we tend to have specialist pupillages offered, but we also like pupils to have a second discipline uh, that they will do sort of at a low level and that will be a bit of a filler to start with. So when I first got on my feet I did a little bit of personal injury work because there's a lot of junior PI work about and I did that just to fill my diary. Mm. But it was a specialist family pupillage, what I did. But I mean, I think there's an ethos in our chambers of doing everything for five years if you can. Um, people in chambers tend to specialise from about five years upwards mm. in the different areas of family law. But um, you still have senior practitioners across the whole breadth of family law. So um, we mentioned care proceedings, financial remedy proceedings, uh, international work and what you call private law and also court of protection, which is a bit of an offshoot of um, care proceedings, I suppose. So um, from about five years up, then you start to specialise. But if you, um, you know, if you're talking about subsidising your, your legal aid practice with a bit of private work, um, you know, most people just want to do that naturally because uh, legal aid rates go downwards and private rates go upwards so it's sort of a natural reaction um, you know it's there's some chambers in London which don't do any legal aid work and there's some that only do legal aid work so obviously the way you tailor your application to those the different chambers is quite important uh, we cover the range so you, you don't need to tailor it in any way for us but other chambers are different to us I would echo what Michael said. I'm also at a set of chambers who do the whole range of family law work and we, we do um, legally aided work and we do privately paying work. I think it's natural, at, certainly at my stage, that by the very nature of my practice, I do some legally aided work and I do some privately paying work. So they both, I suppose they both feed into what I take home at the end of the day. I wouldn't, I, I haven't, Specialised, I do all areas of family law and I wouldn't expect to do so in the near future. I'm certainly very much enjoying finding my feet and working out what I like and, and, and what I'm good at and I certainly wouldn't want to rule anything out at this stage. I'm very much enjoying the breadth and diversity that, of practice that I have at the moment. I think that's a good thing about family law. Mm. That it covers such a broad range of things. Yes. You know, there's very little similarities between care proceedings and financial remedy proceedings frankly apart from the fact that you're in court and you're talking to a judge the whole subject matter of the case is completely different uh, the style of advocacy style of negotiation the advice you have to give is a completely different world so if you can go to a chambers that you, that gives you an opportunity to do all of them great because you never know what you're gonna you're going to enjoy 
and also you never know in which direction you're going to be pushed because um, things happen naturally at the bar. That's one of the good things about it. Opportunities come out which you've never thought about, um, and doors open, doors close, and it's all um, you know part of the interest of the job. You never quite know what's going to happen. Mm. I would say at this stage, my advice would be, if you can, keep your options open and keep them as wide open as possible for as long as you can, um, because there are always changes and cuts to to our sector. Um, it's good to have a mix of legally aided practice and privately paying practice, because we don't know which way or direction things will go. And also, if you're, if you're anything like the three of us, the, the mix and the diversity is something that keeps you interested. Um, I, I, I am starting to find that a practice is finding me in the sense that I'm developing more of a children practice than I am of money um, but that's partly because the set I'm in isn't a very big money set and I think that I'm just better at children work and I enjoy it more and that feeds into what Michael was saying about it being quite a natural thing I think after a few years your practice kind of finds you in a way uh, but I'm still very keen to carry on with money work because I don't want to close the door on that at this stage I think it's a bit premature so a question on this side. Um, yeah, sorry, um, could you give me some information about if there's any um, training or courses on the side that which can help us? Um, it depends what stage you're at. Are you at mm. bar school? Um, no, second year undergraduate. I think it's just to get as much experience as possible that um, feeds into a, an application to family chambers. So mini pupillages are the obvious thing to do. Uh, the other one is working at a solicitor's firm, specialising in this kind of work. Um, in terms of courses, you know, if you can take up any family modules, that's great. If, you don't, if you're not doing law, don't worry about it. You know, that's just something to um, add in that shows an interest in the area. Anything, I think, that can show an interest. So law centres, uh, CAB, legal advice clinics. Um, any kind of work experience that you think is going to set you apart frankly, because, you know, as you all know, you get a lot of applications to Chambers, so uh, anything that when we come to read the applications is going to set you apart. My assumption, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but my assumption is that at the junior end of the family bar, a lot of the work will be stuff like non-molestation orders, care orders, etc., within the max court. To what extent is the rise of sister advocates going to eat away at that work if I chose to go to family bar? Um, you are partly right in your assumption the sort of really junior family work certainly in Manchester is non-moll orders like you've talked about and work. We're now, we now have, have the single family court so we don't have a magistrate's court anymore or a family proceedings court but we have the magistrate's tier of the single family court and that is the lowest tier of the court so generally you would expect to see junior juniors at, at that level um, but not, not always um, I have found in Manchester that more um, solicitors are doing more advocacy because the fee structure <coughs> incentivises them to do so. Um, I have found that the interlocutory hearings, um, case management conferences and issues resolution hearings or FEDRA hearings in private law proceedings um, and the interlocutory ancillary relief cases, although they're, they're not generally publicly funded anymore, are tended to be done by solicitors because they're more straightforward, most of the time they're not contested and they don't require as much preparation. I find that I'm quite often brought into cases at the beginning when there might be a contested matter and then at the end for the final hearing which can sometimes be a number of days in length. Um, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing because it's helping me to develop my skill more and more in, ad in the area of advocacy and that distinguishes me more and more from the role of a solicitor and I think it's that skill set that we need to provide as barristers, that, that's what differentiates us. Um, so that, yes, there certainly has been a knock-on effect with the, with the funding structure, but um, it's just about offering a different type of service now and being more available for the contested matters and accepting that that seems to be the way that we're moving. Um, I, I'm not short of work and, and none of, nor are my colleagues and, and nor are uh, Michael and Francis from speaking to them today and I think that seems to be typical of the London bar as well. Mm. Okay. I don't know whether your experiences differ from that. No, I would, I would echo that. I, I have certainly, certainly there are lots of solicitor advocates but they don't necessarily want to do every stage of every hearing. I think, that, I think that's quite right. 
Um, so I think there will always be a space for the bar. There will always be people who want who want specialist advocates, and that's that's what we have to market ourselves as. I mean, it was halcyon days for the bar for a long time. I mean, we used to do all of the hearings. Mm. Uh, you talk to senior practitioners. Um, you know, when everything briefs kind of, sort of fell into their laps, that's the impression that you get that every hearing was done by the bar, pretty much. Um, and you'd often have a solicitor at court as well as a barrister. And if there was funding for that, a solicitor wouldn't do it themselves because they can get paid and also get the barrister as well. That's all gone. Okay, so you're generally, in publicly funded work especially, generally be there on your own as a barrister. Um, but exactly as Francis says, that doesn't mean um, that there's not a role for the specialist advocate. In fact, the role is probably better and more interesting because if you... Uh, walked into the Royal Courts of Justice and saw a care case where there's been serious injuries to a child or the child has died, you're going to see barristers in that case. Um, or if you have a you know, £10 million financial case, the solicitor is going to instruct a barrister. So still for those cases, there's still kind of a circle that will all, of cases that will always go to the bar. Maybe that circle's not as big as it used to be. But the work that's in that circle, just to bear with me on my analogy, is more um, is more interesting. So there's a role, definitely, maybe um, smaller but more interesting. Any other questions? Is there still a few? How has direct access affected your practices? Uh, I've done the training. No cases so far. <laughs> so uh, in a very limited way, I would say. Um, but it has affected the practices of fellow members of chambers, yeah. Some people would do, um, you know, a majority of their practices now direct access. So I think the opportunity is there for people to do it. Uh, they, there was a rule, I think, that you had to be three or five years cool before you could be trained. That's now gone. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, junior people like me and Francis and Emma are now doing the training. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole new world. It's a bit frightening because people can then start calling you at your desk, uh, which is really not what we, what we want to be happening. Um, you know, but it's it's a different way of working. I think the the kind of cases will be more like conferences in chambers, so people will come directly to a barrister for a specific issue. For example, drafting a prenuptial agreement or um, settling a financial case without a hearing those kind of things, they'll come straight to the barrister to do that work for them. And, and you know, our, our sales pitch is that we're more cost effective than solicitors at doing that work. Um, you know, seems to be working so far without having annoyed the solicitors too much, but we'll see, I don't know. I'm, I, sorry, are you about to round us up? I was going to say, yeah, if you're wrapping up. Please. Is there anything else before we finish? There's, there's one more question at the back, we'll take one more. Um, the lady in the middle said you cover a broad range of subjects in your early, in your early years. To what extent could you shut out areas that you're not interested in in your early years? I certainly, I, I think I probably could if I chose to, because as Michael said to you, we are self-employed, so I suppose ultimately if, if I wanted to make it very clear to the clerks that I had no interest in doing a particular branch of family law, then I would be able to say that to them. But I suppose what I would say about that is that I, I think that that tactic is, is risky because, as you've already heard, quite often your practice to an extent finds you. You, you do some work, you are for, on a particular case, maybe that case goes very well, and then you end up doing lots more of that type of work. So I would, I would be worried, even if I didn't find the whole range of things interesting, and I do, I will be worried about pigeonholing myself mm -hmm. too soon and blocking out opportunities for me to find what find that particular niche that I might develop a bit, a bit later on. I would imagine that's money as well that potentially you could get <laughs> that you're not getting because you said I'm not doing it. Well, potentially, yeah. I think you'd be you'd be ruling yourself out of if a solicitor phones into chambers and says I've got a care case, for example. If I've said to the clerks that I will never ever do any care work then clearly they can't put my name forward. So that might be a day in court that I miss out on. But as I say, I think it has bigger implications for your practice more generally than just missing out on a few days in court. I think you're, you're potentially ruling yourself out of, of something that you might 
later on end up doing um, all the time. I suppose what I would say is if there's areas that you really, that you think hold no interest for you, then it is worth researching each set of chambers very carefully because, as Michael's already said, there are chambers, certainly I can think of them in London, who, for example, wouldn't do any care cases if that's what you wanted to avoid or would do fewer money cases than other, other sets might do if, if, if that was something you wanted to avoid. So I suppose it's all about tailoring your application and thinking about it very carefully if you are set on a particular course right at the moment.